Welcome back. This is Chris and my brother in Christ, Stephen. Welcome back. Our uh, date today is August 28th, year of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2022. And the title of this sermon is going to be called Futurism. Futurism. Now, this is more a uh, continuation of the video series we did before on Jesuit prophecy because the church today is infatuated with the Society of Jesus Prophecy. Now, last um, last video series we did, we did it on preterism. Stephen, can I see that? Uh, yes. Preterism. So, preterism is out. It's no good. Most people realize that. To say that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD and that the book of Revelation was written in the <coughs> 60, uh, 67 AD, it doesn't hold up okay doesn't hold up to the historical record so now we're down to the historicist perspective because that's what all the Protestant reformers used right and then we have <coughs> the futurist view oh the oh. judeo-christian church today right. loves the Jesuit futuristic view so that's what it's down to, those two choices. For somehow that God has just kept it hidden in a secret until Darby brought it to our awareness in 1830. And before that, all these Protestant reformers, apparently they were wrong, right? Wrong, ladies and gentlemen. So let's just talk about futurism. As we see the evangel uh, evangelical uh, churches hold either of two views of Revelation. Number one, that it's prophecies from Revelation chapter uh, 4 onward still await fulfillment. That's where you get futurism. It's all in the future. Or number two, that Revelation has been progressively fulfilled in the history of Europe, pagan and papal, whence it is known as the historical interpretation. You know what's interesting though, you talk about the evangelical churches, and I like words, words have meaning. So I looked up evangelical, excuse me, and evangelical comes from evangel. Evangel is made up of two words, EU, which means good, and angelos, which means good news. So that, the being an evangelical or an evangelist is about spreading the good news, the gospel, right? God's spell. The gospel is made up of two words, God plus spell, which is from Genesis to Revelation. So evangelical, number one, of or relating to or being in an agreement with the Christian gospel, especially as it is presented in the four gospels, also means Protestant, which is revitalized Christianity, emphasizing salvation by faith in the atoning death of Jesus Christ through the personal conversion, the authority of Scripture, and the importance of preaching as contrasted with ritual. I thought that was interesting. So here you have evangelical churches going against the very name of the word evangelical by embracing Jesuit prophecy. Because the Society of Jesus was behind the Counter-Reformation. And remember, the Counter-Reformation did up, I think it was over a hundred anathemas, which means you're, they're damning your soul to hell. They're cursing your soul to hell because you believe in the atoning death of Jesus Christ through personal conversion and the authority of Scripture. This is something that the Society of Jesus is totally against, yet the Church of today embraces Jesuit prophecy, specifically futurism. I thought that was interesting. Well, evangelical is also referring to fundamentalism or a fundamentalist. And that is a movement in the 20th century Protestantism emphasizing the literally interpreted Bible as fundamental to Christian life and teaching, the beliefs of this movement and adherence to such beliefs. And that's where you get the word low church. So that's really what that was, is the fundamentalist movement was saying, hey, we're getting away because we're embracing Jesuit doctrine, we're taking our doctrine from the Roman Catholic Church, and we need to get back to the fundamentals. That's what we see in the fundamentalist movement. 
Now, all of this gets down to the distinction between, uh, it also means low church. Now, low church is different from high church. Low church is uh, tending, especially in the Anglican worship, to minimize emphasis on the priesthood, sacraments, and ceremonial in worship and often emphasize evangelical principles. So that's what this is all about. It's about the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, the authority of Scripture, preaching the good news. Now, high church is about uh, worshiping worship in a sacerdotal, liturgical, ceremonial, traditional elements where you need a priest as your mediator. It's very high, it's very high church. You have all these fancy ceremonies and traditions that a lot of times lead us away from the truth. So we see those are basically our two choices. We find uh, the choice between the historical or the futurist perspective. Now, you have anything to add, Stephen? Yeah, the futurism is a uh, emphasis, uh, emphasized dynamism, speed, technology, youth, violence, and objects such as the car, the airplane, the industrial city. And evangelist is um, any of the authors of the four Gospels. Uh, in the uh, you know, If you look up the definition, it's traditionally Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. One who practices evangelism, especially a Protestant preacher or missionary. And the third one was where I think where a lot of these Masons probably fit in. So one who promulgates or promotes something enthusiastically. Hmm. Okay. Not necessarily religious, but it seems to, uh, for the most part, be that way. So evangelism is about, you're talking about preaching the gospel, right? Right. Right. About, you're saying that evangelism is referring to the four, first four books of the Bible. Right. It's interesting because when you get into futurism, they have some strange doctrine that doesn't take the whole Bible as one complete book. And that, we're going to discuss that. So when we're looking into futurism, we have two false premises known as dispensationalism and futurism, which creates misguided devotion to modern Zionist state of Israel and a false hope of a soon secret rapture of the church. You notice that they are embraced with Zionism. Now, what is Zionism? Zionism is a nationalist movement that espouses the establishment of and support for a homeland for the Jewish people. Centered in the area roughly corresponding to the land of Israel, the region of Palestine, Canaan, or the Holy Land on the basis of a long Jewish connection and attachment to that land. See, the church today um, supports the synagogue of Satan. They support those Jews that claim to be Jews but are of the synagogue of Satan. We'll have any type of honest conversation about the religion of Judaism, ladies and gentlemen. It's rooted in Phariseeism. Jesus Christ condemned Phariseeism. And looking at what, the, what Judaism is about and how they hate Jesus, the, how they hate the apostles... They say that in their own uh, works out of the Babylonian Talmud. Why is it called Babylonian Talmud, Stephen? Because they kind of get it from Babylon, right? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, they look at uh, Jesus as boiling in hot semen and the disciples as boiling in hot excrement. Not Christian at all, ladies and gentlemen. No. It seems like the summary of futurism would be focusing on the progress of modernity. Modernity. The future is sought to sweep away traditional artistic notions and replace them with energetic celebration of the machine age. Focus was placed on creating a unique and dynamic vision of the future and artists incorporated portrayals of urban landscapes as well as new technologies such as trains, cars, airplanes into their depictions. Speed, violence, and the working classes were all glorified by the group as ways to advance change and their work covered a variety of art forms including architecture, sculpture, literature, theater, music, and even food. Okay. So you're looking at you're you're looking at um, futurism from a, a political aspect. Um, from and and we're talking about futurism from a religious aspect. 
futurism dealing with uh, beginning with Darby in 1830. So it's, it's interesting, it all ties together, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So we see that um, the two false premises of futurism are known as dispensationalism, and futurism creates a misguided devotion to the modern Zionist state of Israel and a false hope of a soon secret rapture of the church. It is believed that these series of visions were received by John in 96 AD while he was a prisoner of the Roman authorities for his faith and testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we see dispensationalism is a particular, it's kind of interesting, it's a particular hermeneutic or analytical system for interpreting the Bible based on the literal translation. I don't know about that, I disagree with that. Uh, and which stands in contrast to the earlier Calvinistic system of covenant theology. Now they like to say it's Calvinistic instead of just saying it's part of the Protestant Reformation or that it is truly biblical. Now, system of covenant theology used in the fundamentalist Bible biblical interpretation. So that's what we used to use is based upon the covenant theology. Go ahead, my brother. Well, also dispensal, dispensal, dispensationalism. Yeah, that dispensationalism <laughs> is a doctrine prevalent in some forms of Protestant Christianity that divides history into distinct periods, each marked by a different dispensation or relationship between God and humanity. Dispensationalism further holds that Christian believers will be transported to heaven without warning, and that soon thereafter there will, will be a period of tribulation followed by the second coming. Right, and that's where you get the, um, the secret rapture yep. of the church. Now, bear in mind that the secret rapture was only embraced by the Roman Catholic Church, and then eventually through this Society of Jesus, it was eventually um, brought into the Protestant Christian movement. So it's something, it's a relatively new term. Now, I want to spend some time just talking about this. It's talking about, um, it says, it stands in contrast to the earlier Calvinistic system of covenant theology. Now, covenant theology is referring to what? Covenants. Covenants are promises that God has made. And so, therefore, theology is the study of the covenants that God made with his people and it's been throughout the entire world it is something that is um, connected it's continuous and that's where it differs from the dispensational dispensational is basically saying that it's God's doing this over here and then he's doing something entirely over here in this dispensation and then he's doing something over here and it's very erratic dispensationalism is a particular hermeneutic, or analytical system for interpreting the Bible based on a literal translation, translation, and which stands in contrast to earlier Calvinist system of covenant theology used in fundamentalist biblical interpretation. So it's something new. It's going against church mm, history is right. what it is. And dispensationalism, uh, what does it say, Stephen? It was first developed by John, John Nelson, Nelson Darby, yeah, around, around 1830. So... If that's true, then you have the Christian church that was all wrong until Darby got it right, and now that's what we operate from. It was all these early church fathers, the second century church fathers, these Bibles that were brought forth, they're all wrong until John Darby got it. I don't think so, ladies and gentlemen. Now, it's interesting that it says it was first developed by John Nelson Darby. And it, and it considers biblical history as divided into, by God, into dispensations. Now these are, uh, you want to read that a little bit more, Stephen? Well, yeah, it says dispensationalist presuppositions start with the inductive reasoning that biblical history has a particular discontinuity in the way God reacts to humanity in the unfolding of their sometimes supposed free will. Now let's take a moment of what Stephen just read. He says dispensationalist presupposition, that's your axiom, your starting point, it starts with the inductive, inductive reasoning, mm -hmm. not deductive reasoning. Now inductive reasoning, if you look that word up, the inductive reasoning is a method of reasoning in which a body of observation is considered to drive a general principle 
It consists of making broad generalizations based upon specific observations. Inductive reasoning is distinct from deductive reasoning. If the premises are correct, the conclusion of a deductive argument is certain. In contrast, the truth of the conclusion of an inductive argument is probable based upon the evidence given. So you notice it's a difference, not deductive reasoning. See, when you use deductive reasoning, you're looking for facts. And then from the facts, you deduce the truth. Right. But this is inductive. It's probable. It's making generalizations that are broad that aren't necessarily true. This is all about this is all about dispensationalism. Now that is really interesting. Also, it talks about discontinuity. Discontinuity. I wish I had my uh, dictionary with me, but we're just going to go by memory. Discontinuity is not something that's um, con con uh, con uh, when you have something continuous, right? It's discontinuous. It's not continuous. Like if you have an electrical circuit and you're having light right now, it's continuous. But they're saying it's discontinuous. Discontinu discontinuity. Discontinuity? Yeah, discontinuity. Lack of continuity, logical sequence or cohesion, a break or gap. A surface at which seismic wave velocities change. But now, a you, break you know, or a gap, it's a space. It's, yeah, so it's not continuous, it's right? It's not continuous. If, if you, you could not have electricity, you know, when you turn off the light switch, then it becomes discontinuity. Right. Right now you have the light going because electricity is flowing. That's continuous. You notice that what they're saying is that God is discontinuous. He's erratic. He, he He's not something that is that is continuous through. Now that's totally different from what the early church believed. The early church believed that you had the fall of mankind and God has gone through covenant theology and there's different covenants throughout but it's divided into the old covenant and the new covenant. So this dispensationalism is something totally contrary to the fundamental Christian faith. Um, and so it, this is what it says. So I thought that was really interesting. So we see here, looking at this concept, let me continue here, all right. Uh, yeah, we already covered this, but according to dispensationalism, each of God's plan is thus administered in a certain way, and humanity is held responsible as a steward during that time. Dispensationalist presuppositions start with inductive reasoning that biblical history has a particular discontinuity in the way God reacts to humanity in the unfolding of their free wills. Dispensation is a general state or ordering of things, specifically a system of revealed commands and promises. So as you see that dispensationalism makes things up, ladies and gentlemen. Now, there is a disagreement between covenant theology and dispensationalism regarding the meaning of revelation. Now, they talk about covenant theology views the New Testament as the key to interpreting the Old Testament. We've talked about this before, right. but the Old Testament and the New Testament are one complete book. Mm -hmm. Not dispensationalists, they don't believe that, ladies and gentlemen. So, we have, you have the Old Covenant and you have the new covenant. And we're going to prove that through the scriptures. But they say, oh, no, no, no. That we, we are dispensationalists. We, uh, they view that therefore the con... Let me lose. Let me get back to my train of thought. I lost my place. They view... Um, they, there exists a disagreement between covenant theology or what the Protestant reformers believed and dispensationalism regarding the meaning of revelation. Covenant theology views the New Testament as the key to interpreting the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They are one complete book. That's why we look at, we can find um, the meanings of words by basically going back and forth 
uh, between the Old Testament and New Testament. In fact, there's talking about the Bible being continuous. There are over 300 prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ found in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. You have something to say, my brother? Yeah, well, uh, um, it says that um, classic dispensationalists, or dispensationalists believe that Israel as a nation will embrace Jesus as their Messiah toward the end of the Great Tribulation, right before the Second Coming. Right. Now, this is, this is kind of a complicated subject, ladies and gentlemen, because today the church, this Americana Judeo-Christianity, identifies the Jews as Israel, as God's chosen people. And if you do not correctly identify Israel, then your prophecy is going to be skewed and it's going to be wrong. So that's what we see going on. So we see that therefore concepts such as biblical covenants and promises to Israel are believed to be interpreted by the New Testament as applying to the church. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, one complete sacred book. That's what we've been preaching for some time. But dispensationalism, futurism, says holds that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are interpreted using literal, grammatical, historical interpretation. Now, what is grammatical, historical interpretation? I thought that was interesting. They say that you have to use a grammatical, historical interpretation. Now, what that means is that is a modern Christian method of interpreting the Bible. Is that surprising? No. That is the Laodicean time. You make stuff up. You make up theories. You don't regard the, you remove the ancient landmarks, and that's what we have. And so the historical grammatical method that dispensationalists use is a modern Christian method that strives to discover the biblical author's original intended meaning in the text. According to the historical ma grammatical method, if based on an analysis of the grammatical style of a passage with consideration to its cultural, historical, and literary context, it appears that the author intended to convey an account of events that actually happened. Then the text should be taken as representing history. Passages should only be interpreted symbolically, poetically, or allegorically if to the best of our understanding that is what the writer intended to convey to the original audience. Um, it is the primary method of interpretation for uh, many, they say, Protestant exegetes, but that is just people that have been influenced by the Roman Catholic Church. And so this is what we see. And so take this for example. In the beginning God created heaven and earth and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now do I need some historical grammatical wrath, uh, record where I have to go back and know Moses' true intent and I have to go back and understand the cultural norms and that that should be taken um, symbolically or poetically or allegorically? Absolutely not. That's not how you interpret the Bible. The Bible has a built-in dictionary. The Bible means what it says and says what it means. So you notice that this dispensational uses this historical grammatical method. Go ahead, my brother. Well, it says, according to the historical grammatical method, if based on analysis of the grammatical style of passage, it appears that the author intended to convey an account of events that actually happened. Then the text should be taken as representing history. Passages should only be interpreted symbolically, poetically, or allegorically. So I have to understand all this cultural stuff. When I'm reading Genesis, I have to go back and, and find somebody who has apparently gone back and knows the original meaning and the life and the culture and the grammatical syntax of all. That's how I'm we supposed to read the Bible. the original Greek, the Latin, or the Hebrew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what that does is that just makes, uh, what that says is that you cannot read the Bible straightforwardly. That all this stuff is, is it's Kabbalism. It is, it is. It means that you need some type of cipher <laughs> to understand the Word of God. And you don't. Mm -mm. You don't need a cipher. 
That's a code word, the historical grammatical method is using a cipher. So you look, you notice that this dispensationalism doesn't believe that the Old Testament and New Testament are one complete book. So let's continue here. We find that dispensationalism holds that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are interpreted using literary, grammatical, historical interpretation, which means you need a cipher to understand them. As a result, they reject the idea that the meaning of the Old Testament was hidden and that the New Testament can alter the straightforward meaning of the Old Testament. Well, that's pure propaganda, ladies and gentlemen. What they're saying is, is that if you believe that the New Testament unlocks truths that were hidden in the Old Testament, then um, they disagree with that. Well, that's not even Christian, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to walk you through in Hebrews exactly the Old Testament and the New Testament. Good, my brother. It's kind of like, you know, they, they already used all the different, uh, whether it was uh, Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, but because the biblical languages are in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the interpreters stress the importance of knowing these languages. So now I have to know dead languages <laughs> to read the Bible. Yeah. You have to know, you have to go, and i got to learn wait, all wait, about wait, 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 we know how to, all those languages, so you come to us. Ding, ding, ding. And we'll tell you what. You are my sacerdotal yes. priest. You are my clergy, and I'm just a dumb laity, so whatever you say. This, that's what this is, ladies and gentlemen. This is what Darby or the Jesuits are bringing to you, and the church has, has swallowed the bait. So... It's, it, you notice all this sophistry, all this complicated psycho babble. But when you break it down, you should be able to read the Bible straightforwardly. So this is just the introduction of, of what futurism is. Futurism is Jesuit prophecy. And the church today should not be getting their prophecy or their doctrines from the Holy See, the Vicar of Christ, the Pontius Maximus. They should be getting their doctrine from Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. God bless you and come to Jesus Christ. Thank you. Bye.